So uh, what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to get into uh, the technical side of the uh, iFix 2022 release. So um, get into the details, and I'm going to focus on the productivity, meaning the configurations hub, the ability to build a project much quicker than we had in the past. And this allows us to integrate uh, iFix into uh, automation controllers uh, like we've never been able to do before, and also incorporate the concept of modeling. So those are the types of things we're going to do. And uh, with inside of this presentation, uh, we've also talked about other enhancements of, about the installer. The installer is now 15 minutes, not three hours. We have a uh, new prophecy authentication, which uh, integrates our um, authentication across our portfolio and into your domain. So uh, with that said, in the iFix environment, I have iFix 2022 up here. And I'm going to start off by just showing you uh, one of the popular applications that our users uh, typically deploy, and that is the industrial gateway server. And I'm showing you this because I'm showing you the, um, the uh, configuration that I have. This is the driver that I have, and I'm going to use the simple simulation uh, protocol that's available in the driver and show you how you can quickly build an iFix tag database just from the IGS configuration. And then secondly, I'll spin back and I'll show you how to do the same thing, but we'll use the concept of modeling behind that, where in this particular um, project, I have a plant and within my plant, I have remotes, RTUs, and within my RTUs, I have instances of my RTUs, so I have three instances, one, two, three. And within those instances, you'll see that I have process variables that my RTU might have in them. Here I have a simple example with three process variables. I know if you have a controller out there, or even in this example, an RTU, it may have um, hundreds or even thousands of process variables associated with it. So that's the you know, the the um, connection into your controller environment. What I'm going to show you here is how do we integrate that into uh, the iFix environment and how do we configure iFix um, using this structure that we have in the IGS. So to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is under applications, we have a new icon over here called configuration hub. And as you hit that, you notice it's launching a version of Chrome, so it is 100% web-based. And I'm going to sign into my Chrome. And this is the configuration hub environment that you see on the screen. Uh, two things going on. I have Prophecy Authentication up top, and then down below I have iFix. In this presentation, we'll concentrate on iFix. Within iFix, I have three selections in the navigation connections, modeling, in the database, okay? So first of all, I'll start off with just simple tag configuration. Hey, I got a couple new points in my controller. I would like to use those in the iFix environment. How would I do that? Uh, I would do that by hitting the connections. And this brings up and it's interrogating the IGS configuration for me. So now it's giving me a list of everything in the industrial gateway server. This will also work with OPC UA. So if you have an OPC UA device, works the same way. Um, I'm gonna just go in and grab a couple tags out of the driver. And as you can see, I'm drilling into my simulator tags and I'll do a simple browse. And this will give me a list of all the tags in the IGS driver. And this is just a flat tag structure here for this first example. And I'll simply um, select two random tags here. And it goes into something called a staging. And what the staging allows you to do is it allows you to format your tag names. So you can go with the format that the IGS already has. Maybe you have a elaborate structure that you built in the symbolic controllers that we have, or maybe you don't, maybe it's uh, kind of messy. So here's a chance to clean that up where I could trim the tag name down and maybe I just want the tag names to be random. Or I can add a prefix to it. So 
I can just put a prefix on it. You can put your tag name or your site name, whatever associated with it, and it will build out that structure for you. So it's building out a tag name structure for you. You can also select here the type. So if I want to make this one a different type of tag, maybe an analog alarm tag or a discrete tag, you can do that as well. You can choose to historize the tag. So it'll automatically house it to the historian uh, and so on. So um, you can do all that through this configuration hub environment. I can do this online without uh, using the database manager that we use in the past. Once I'm satisfied with the, uh, the configuration for my tag names, down here at the bottom right is a uh, create tags uh, selection. And I'll just do that and you'll see up top, it says two tags were created successfully. So we're good to go. With this simple example, I'm gonna now go to my database uh, navigation and you see it brings up another tab and there you'll see it has the two tags that I just created. Two simple tags. Hey, I didn't have to type in an IO address. I didn't have to look at my IGS driver. I could all do this, click and drag. Um, you notice here a couple new icons, unpublished, and the ones that are checked are called published. So this allows me to build the iFix database really offline, something that we really didn't do in the past. Um, so I can build this configuration offline, and when I'm done with it, I can publish that. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, you have a couple features here. You can save your uh, selection here. You can uh, use this uh, icon here to publish your tags. So here's my traditional database manager that we've used in the past, and that still works, frankly. You can still use that if you'd like. But in addition, we have this uh, configuration hub environment. I'm going to go then and publish that. And it will bring up this publish uh, window. Do I want to publish the database? Do I want to stop the SAC process? So that's our scan alarm process. That means it's going to stop the database temporarily. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to publish live and not bump my system. So I'm going to uncheck that and just say publish. And that will go through the publishing process of taking my tag configuration and moving it from this web environment into the running system without affecting the status of, of the uh, IFX database. So there you go. You'll see they're now checked. If I wanted to filter through here and type in uh, my random, you'll see it will sort. And uh, there's my published tags right there. If I looked at my database manager, uh, you'll see I now have my two tags created in that environment. So that's, you know, two simple tags in there. It beats typing in a bunch of tag names and attributes. It, but it, it beats uh, discovering what the IO address is, particularly with the uh, symbolic controllers where you have really long addresses. And uh, let's face it, you probably put a lot of time in the structure when you built your PLC program. So we want to leverage that structure. So uh, moving on, I'm going to go back to this environment and um, close down some of this stuff. And we're going to go back to our connections. And this time, I'm going to build a model or a structure using the same structure we used in the industrial gateway server. And the way we do that is I'm going to drill down into my plant. And as you remember, in my plant, I have RTUs. And I'm going to browse into the RTU. So it's drilling into that group of tags or that device and it's showing that in the configuration hub environment. I can now select, I want to create a hierarchy and use that same hierarchy that I've already built in the controller. And I want to use that in iFix. So I'm going to select this RTU1. And the concept here is I'm going to build a template that it can reuse over and over. So the real value of this is a lot of times you'll have assets that are similar or identical to each other. I know if you have an RTU, you might have a pump station or a wellhead, and guess what? You have multiple ones. You might have several or you might have hundreds. This will allow you to leverage that model over that whole um, 
set of assets. So I selected my RTU one and uh, by right clicking, if you have a bunch of process variables under that, you can simply say select children and it will select the, uh, the process variables underneath that that you want. So um, once you have that done, instead of staging tags and building individual tags, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click here and I'm gonna create a type. This is an asset type. Uh, and it's going to be used for my model as we move forward. So I'm going to just say uh, create type. And it says type one here. And I'm going to just make it generic. I'm going to just call it RTU. And, uh, and uh, maybe give it a little name here. And keep the same arc, uh, hierarchy in my structure. And go ahead and create that. So it's gonna go and create that type for me. If there's errors or anything like that, there's a log file that's generated and you have a nice hyperlink there to get to that log file and see what's going on. Okay, so I did my browse, I did my connection, I'm good to go like that with that. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the model and see what it built for me. So it builds another tab here. I don't really need this other um, browse capability. So I'll uh, collapse that down. And then in this window here, it built this type, this object type called an RTU. And in that object type, I have variables. These are, these can be different types of variables. Typically they're tag names. They're, they're typically linked to a controller. And uh, once I have that, I can create instances of that type. But before I do that, I'm going to customize this particular type. Okay, because I want to use the same type for multiple RTUs. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to right click over here and edit my type. And that brings up another window where I'm actually modifying the structure that the IGS brought in. And I'm going to make it generic because I want to use this for many RTUs. And I want to create multiple instances using this template that I'm creating here. So you're doing a little legwork up front, but as you add a new device or a new uh, um, uh, structure, it's already built. So let's go in and modify the standard template. I'm just going to go in here and say, you know what, instead of actually putting a, an instance number here, we'll just put an X for a placeholder for the number. And this is just for the description. You can do whatever you want here. And you notice here on the right side is as I go into this, you'll see that it's changing the description here. And there's the IO address that came from R RTU number one. And there's my generic. And these are my tag names that you're familiar with in IFIX, right? It has the same different fields that you had in IFIX. So that's all it is. But I would like to do a substitution. So down here at the bottom, instead of hard coding these names in here or these addresses, I'm gonna substitute these dynamically based on each instance of the RTU. So we're gonna go under here, we're gonna add a couple substitutions and I'll call it uh, my RP, RTU uh, number. We'll call it uh, RTU num. And then over here under the value, I'm gonna give it one. And so this would be like your PID number. So it's your loop, you know, 101 or loop 201, whatever you got, uh, is what you're building up here. Hey, Greg, so, a couple of people had questions about tags, if you uh, if you want to address these real quick. Um, uh, folks are asking, is there is there a limit to how many tags you can publish at one time without stopping SAC? Um, I don't have uh, firsthand experience with that yet, since uh, we're pretty new with release. Um, they're telling me it's magnitudes quicker when you stop SAC. Um, okay. You know, to me, you, you, probably time is not that critical in, in most cases. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd say if you're developing offline, meaning I'm developing a new system, it's not running uh, actual processes, I would probably stop, stop SAC and get it done with. If I'm in a live system and I'm running product, 
you really don't want to do that. So I think you got the uh, time to make that happen. Gotcha. One, one other. So does the online publish work in enhanced failover or do you still need to force maintenance mode first? Um, I'm going to defer that question. I believe it publishes on as as it runs. Okay. But cool. um, maybe in Q&A, I can do a little research for you or, or come Sounds back. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, okay. I'm going to add one more um, placeholder here. And this is my, um, we're going to do my uh, high um, engineering units. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my high engineering units dynamically. And we'll just have it scaled zero to 100 um, right here. And um, kind of set that up. So I'm going to, these are substitutions that I'm going to use in my system. So I'm going to save this right now, top save button up top. And then I'm going to use these substitutions through my tag. So we're going to do, you know, spend a little time uh, modifying these uh, this template, and then later on you'll see we'll get a lot of value out of that. So the X placeholder, instead of typing in RTU number, that's going to be what I'm going to be replacing dynamically. They put in a nice feature here where it's going to actually uh, look here and give me a list. So I'm going to put in the placeholder and it's this is the placeholder that's going to substitute and i can do that as simple as the description or i can do that right here in the uh, io address as well and you can have many substitutions i just got one one or two here for uh, example and uh, so let's go ahead to our level tag and we'll do the same thing um, and we're just going to substitute that in and we'll do the same for our IO address uh, for this guy right here. And so it's going to just substitute that number in here. One other thing is I have the I have the uh, high engineering units. And what I'm going to do on this guy is I'm going to go down to my alarm limit. And you can actually build an expression in here. So instead of putting a full substitution in here, I'm going to go into expressions and this brings up an expression builder. So I don't have to hard code a substitution in here. I can build a logical expression using math functions or Boolean functions here within the side this. So in this particular case, I want to take my high engineering units and I want to subtract 30 and that will be my alarm limit. I check Simtex to see if it likes it or not. It certainly does. Hit apply. And it put that placeholder in my alarm limit. Okay. So a uh, pretty useful thing. And then finally, I'll get to my status tag. And we'll just do uh, modify. Same thing here with the... Uh, with uh, replace that X with the RTU number and um, for my description. And then same thing with my IO address. Okay, so I made a template out of these guys. So you see that, um, um, you can certainly go in here and modify these manually as well. I'll show you that here in a minute. Uh, and then you have your uh, parameters right here down below your substitution parameters. And those are all inside your iFix tags. So we're good to go. We save that. And next thing we're going to do is we're going to go back to our, our model. And you'll see that I have my RTU here. And uh, within my model, I should be able to go back into, um, into the model itself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an instance of this model. So I did that pre-work for this thing. And as I add an instance, it's going to ask me what my instance name is. So this is going to be my uh, RTU number one instance. 
And we'll go ahead and create that. And what that did is down here at the bottom, it created a instance of that um, RTU. And you'll see I have my uh, high engineering limits and I have my RTU number as the placeholder. And it has a placeholder associated with it. I'm then going back and creating a second instance here, and that's the value of this. To create a whole nother RTU now, all I need to do is add instance. And we're just gonna call this one, guess what? RTU2 and create that instance. And now I have two RTUs, one RTU1, one RTU2. This guy, I'm going to change the substitution to number two. So anywhere I had that generic placeholder, you'll see here when I look at my tag, my description now has a two in it. My address has a two in it. And so I can index or use these placeholders or use these expressions to build that out. Um, let's go look at our level tag and you'll see that, you know, we have our alarm limits that were set and it actually changed my alarm limit and calculated that value uh, from my set limit minus 30. So I'm good to go. I created two RTUs here. You know, I created that um, instance uh, of RTU one and two and I'm good to go. Well, let's look at the database. As I said, this is all happening outside of the iFix database. Uh, as I go into the database, you see that it now has my RTU 1 and 2 with the process variables associated with it. And then you'll also notice they are unpublished. Um, you can go in here and look at it. it, brings over your descriptions and indexes it, indexes my IO address. So everything kind of looks like it's uh, working properly right here. Um, once I have this done and I'm satisfied with it. You can certainly make changes right in this environment as well. If I click in here and I can now go over to the uh, right side and I can make uh, modifications to that specific instance if I wanted to, or I can just go with the instance that I have. Okay, uh, we're gonna go ahead and publish that. And it's going through the publish routine right now. And we're good to go. And now I'm going to leverage those tags in the iFix environment. Okay. So let's look at the, um, go back to the uh, workspace environment. So now I'm in the graphic environment. I'd like to leverage those tags that I just built. I'm going to do that because the model concept in, in iFix 2022 brings that into the graphic environment in addition to the database. So that's that's something new. Uh, to do that, we're going to go to our um, friends, the Dynamo set, and we'll just grab a simple tank out of here and plop that on the screen. And we're going to browse for a data source. And traditionally, we've been browsing for our tag database, right? For a long time, we've been using this database tag, and we select tags out of here. Now we have a new tag uh, tab that is, allows us to pick either a type, remember my RTU type, or I could hard code an instance where I could pick my flow, my level, my status tags within that instance. The graphic I'm gonna build right here is I'm gonna leverage the concept of the model of the instance and pass that on into the graphic. So a lot of times you might have an RTU and you might have 10 of them, and you certainly don't wanna build 10 unique graphics. You wanna use one graphic and propagate the particular asset type within that, within that particular graphic. So to do that, I'm gonna pick types here and I'm going to select uh, my RTU type. I'm going to select my level type. And notice what it's doing here at the bottom. It's building up and automatically putting a placeholder for the particular um, type that I'm that I'm uh, interested in. So it says RTU, and 
it's enclosed in the uh, at signs. So say okay to that, say okay to that. And lo and behold, we have a, a tank with a placeholder in it. And uh, we'll go ahead and add a data link in here. And we might uh, add one more data link in here. And this time I will grab the, um, I'll grab the description of the tag. Remember, we index the description of the tag as well. So to do that, we're going to go in and select um, the description field of that tag. And that should be substituted as well. So this is going to uh, create a, um, a placeholder for all those using my object type. So once I have that built, we need to be able to um, instantiate that instance on this particular graphic. And we do that via a simple one-line script. I'll do it um, by selecting a, just a, I'll give it a name. When I, when I select RTU1, it's going to go and add the um, process variables for RTU1. And if I select um, RTU2 here, it will bring in that particular instance. Okay, so now that I have the text here, we're going to go in and add one simple script. I'm going to go into animations. We'll go into commands. And I want to introduce two new commands here. There's two new commands, set symbol from model browse and set symbol from values. Uh, model browse means the user in runtime could literally select that and they could pick them. They could pick a model type and it would then use that particular selection. Uh, set values means I'm going to do it via code internally. So as the user selects the different screen or different button, it will add it. So remember, my type is called an RTU and my instance is called RTU1. Okay, so pretty straightforward. And that's what it looks like in the little wizard RTU and RTU1. And uh, we're going to go ahead and do the same thing for RTU number two. Animations, click event, select my set symbol values, and then put in my um, type and then my instance. And this is going to be RTU2. Okay. Good to go. Good to go. And uh, let's go ahead and save this graphic. And we'll go into the run environment. As it looks right now, you can see not a lot of information coming in. If I hit RTU1, you'll see it propagates every, all the attributes with RTU1, my level, my description, my value, my animation. If I hit selection two, you'll see it brings in all the attributes around uh, the instance for RTU2. The beauty of this, if I want to add RTU3, I simply go in, add an instance, uh, change the name, change the number to three, and then a simple script in here. Um, with my discrete point, works the same way. I'll show you um, quickly. I'll just look at um, one of my uh, pumps here. And we'll tie our um, we'll tie our status tag. So this is a discrete tag, and we're going to modify the current value of that tag. And so on. So I'm doing the animation tied to this tag. And let's go ahead and we'll put a script on here so I can control this tag. I want to control the current value of that particular tag. And I want to put a push button on here. So as it goes to the zero state, the stop state, or a running state, the start state, um, we're going to be able to do that with a push button. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. I want to show you what's going to happen here. As I go into RTU1, and maybe I want to make a change, I'm going to go ahead and start this. 
And you'll see it comes up. I have an error here. Current block mode doesn't allow writes. Um, so I need to make a, a tag update to my system to do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that in Configuration Hub. I'm going to go back to uh, Configuration Hub, and I'm going to go in and select my status tag. So there's my status tag. And these are just the same iFix fields that you're used to and been using for years. And you know that if you're trying to write to a value, you want to enable output. So I'm going to go enable output, yes. And I'm going to go and do the same thing for my second one and enable that output. Yes. And you'll see that the type now says modify. And within that modification, I'm going to save my configuration. And uh, once that's saved, I can go and publish that uh, to my system. So it's going ahead and publishing that. I'm going to go back into the workspace. Remember, the workspace is still running. I haven't touched the uh, database. And let's go ahead and start that pump. And the error is down. And I'll go to RTU2. And you can start that guy as well. And so two RTUs, I'm able to modify the database dynamically. I'm able to create the database dynamically. I'm able to incorporate that in the graphic environment. There's one more feature I want to show, and um, that's a around the alarm filtering. And um, we take that same concept of the uh, model, and we can filter alarms based on that model as well. So let's go ahead and insert our alarm summary link like we've done in the past here. And this would display my alarm conditions as we normally do. But within that condition, I'm going to double click on there. And we're going to go under filters. And there's a new filter called model context. The model context filter is going to take the model that you're using and propagate that and filter through your alarm summary object. So if I want to know just the alarms for coming in for a certain process area. I can do that uh, by using this guy. So I'm going to go ahead and add filter. Uh, I'm going to include children on this thing or a specific instance. And I'm going to pick my RTU. Okay, so it's all browsable. I don't need to remember this stuff. Uh, I can just apply that to it, and it's going to propagate that through my system. Go back in the run environment. And I'm going to hit RTU1. And you'll see I'm only seeing alarms from RTU1. Go ahead, acknowledge those guys right here. And then over here, I'll hit uh, RTU2, a bunch of communication alarms from Winterly set this up. I'll acknowledge all those. And uh, as I go through the system, it will generate new alarms. You can see I have a high alarm here. I think I get an alarm when I change the value of the pump here. So gives you a change of state alarm. So, you know, you talk about the different uh, alarming concepts. We had alarm areas. We can also do this by the different models as, uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, you know, quickly built a structure using uh, elements that were already built in the IGS, right? You've done that work in the controller. You're building a uh, the type using that same structure, and then you substantiating instances of that type. Once that's done, it builds the database for you, and then you can bring that same concept into the graphics that I'm using right here. Um, just before I wrap up, one more thing I just want to let you know exists. Um, if you actually look at your model types, you can get uh, more complex than that. There's a concept of what we call contained types. Um, so maybe you want to take it to the next level where I might have something called a pump station. And within my pump station, I might have a type called wells. And within my pump station, I also have a type called pumps. So I got a pump A and a pump B. These are what is called contained objects. So I can build a new object and I can contain other objects within that object type. 
And um, that's not hard to build out. You just simply build out your object types and then you build another type and you use contained objects. And if I just went in here and edited that one, I can show you real quickly that under the tab here, the first tab that you see here, these are the variables that are related to this particular object type, my pump station. But within my pump station, I have contained types. I have a well and I have two pumps associated with that. So you can really make a, a pretty extensive model. Uh, and this works fantastic when you have a lot of similar type of assets. So, Jeremy, I did a lot of talk in there. I know you yes, sir. <laughs> like to have a lot of questions. So uh, give me the easy ones first. OK, I can do that. <laughs> no problem. Um, OK, so Alex is wondering, can you edit two tags at once? For example, uh, changing one from a, a no to a yes on both tags at the same time. Two. Uh, not that I know of, but I'll try it okay. as we speak. Not an easy one, but maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it sounded like maybe it was. I, I see. Know. Make it a generic yeah. change. Okay. Um, let's. We'll workshop it. Yeah, we'll work. <laughs> you know, that's 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 the advanced class. That's right. <laughs> We're going to give that a no. Okay. There we go. Cool. <laughs> uh, Jessica is asking uh, Can Configuration Hub be used across multiple different IFIX nodes, each with different? PDB, like for example, what happens if you have eight different IFIX nodes on the same system? Uh, yes, the navigator here would have different node names. So you're going to register the node with Configuration Hub, and then it knows that that node exists. Uh, that's something new in the IFIX 2022 release. So cool. yes, you're, okay. you're able to manage multiple nodes through the same environment. Same with prophecy authentication. Um, and, you know, this configuration hub environment, you're going to be able to, um, you, you can also manage your historian through this interface as well. Uh, how do you register the node with configuration hub? Daniel's asking. Um, so good question. There is a, um, register icon right here. And so with any web-based technology, there's certificates involved and trust and authentication. Um, I know the engineering team right now is developing a quick start guide uh, to make that happen. And they're promising that in the next week or two that will go, really go step-by-step step how you configure this thing. It's not terribly difficult, but if you're not familiar with trusts and certificates and all that kind of stuff. Um, it would be a new frontier with you. Um, the quick start guide is something that they've done with um, IFIX um, 6.5. Uh, next one is, does dynamic IGS addressing work for the modeling? Once you created the model, can you use dynamic IGS addresses for other instances of the model? Um, Yes, it would propagate that through um, through the IGS driver. Because okay. what's going to happen there is when it publishes, the IFIX database is uh, going to request that particular I.O. address. And um, it would then uh, tell the IGS driver that, hey, I got a new dynamic tag and it would go grab that. So okay. certainly, certainly you could do that. Okay, and this is kind of related, I think, but do you have to configure all the connections in IGS before using the new web configuration configurator? You would have to, similar to like you do today, you would have to configure the uh, the channel and the device to make that happen. Gotcha, okay, cool. That covers most of our questions actually at this point. So uh, Greg, was there anything else you wanted to go over today? I feel like you covered uh, a ton of information. Oh uh, yeah, just on that yeah. same topic about yeah. dynamic addressing. You know, a lot of times we can read in the um, 
controller configuration using the IGS driver, depending on what controller you have. But you know, the popular Rockwell controllers and other symbolic controllers out there that will build this structure up here for you. And the goal here is we can leverage that as well. Um, so, you know, right, like this guy is where it automatically discovered my type and grab these things for you. So if you do have it out in your controller, you can certainly go and, and uh, leverage that. Um, just because the variables are here in the driver, it doesn't mean that they're actually being requested by the driver. The driver is only going to request what's in the iFix database. Um, so even though you have a bunch of process variables in here that you might not be using, the driver's not actually going out to request that information. It's requesting whatever you have active in the iFix database. And, and Greg, if somebody's you know interested in taking advantage of these new features, 2022 iFix, what's that process look like? How does that get started? Um, and how do you get involved? Yeah, I think I think this is a good start. I mean, the, what, that's why we're doing these empower ups, and that's why we're doing these deep technical dives. Um, over time, uh, what you'll see is um, YouTube videos based on um, coming from uh, GE directly and coming from from Gray Matter, uh, just like on the uh, Gray Matter YouTube channel. So. You know, we, we don't want you all to figure out how to make this work. I'd rather have you watch a video. This is how I learned and then go ahead and do it. And you can do it at your own pace. Um, so I think that's the best way uh, in newer versions of the iFix training class. We'll also incorporate um, these same type of features. Cool. OK. All right. Well, Greg, thank you so much for the demo. Um, and taking on those questions. I know we had quite a few of them. Um, we actually got one more. I think we have a little more time. Will will iFix 2022 installation ISO be different from the existing 6.5 release? Yes, it's a completely yeah. different installer. It's a completely okay. different application. So, so. Yeah. Um, in the 2022, um, it's, a, it's, it's a unified installer. And that what that means is it installs in the selection, it will install uh, by default. If you install SCADA, it's going to ask you, hey, do you want it a standalone SCADA system? Do you want a network SCADA system? Do you want a client installed? If you pick a SCADA system, it's going to install uh, historian components, uh, iFix, the industrial gateway server, and configure those things to work together. Um, and Jeremy, that's something in the past where we had mm -hmm. three different installers that mm -hmm. you did in different orders and you had reboots <laughs> in the middle of it. And, you know, just me going through this, it took a, a ton of time to set these uh, things up. Um, today, you, you, you set and make your settings and you say go, you come back after a cup of coffee and it's done. Uh, single reboot and you're off to the races. Um, so that it, it, it's, a, it's a huge improvement in, as far as installation goes. Couple more questions, Greg. Jeff was asking, are there any workarounds for IGS not supporting data highway communications in future releases? <laughs> Ouch. No, I guess not that I know of. Okay. Um, I guess, guess that might be for the engineering team. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Legacy systems are getting harder and harder to support because of really operating system changes and um, you know, hardware changes and, and whatnot. I think with the data highway, we were going through a control logics gateway. That's what we've done in the past. So the control logics was actually talking data highway. Um, and you're able to route uh, the, the uh, uh, control logic CIP protocol into DH plus. I believe that still works. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do we have like, a, is there an upgrade guide or checklist for upgrading from, you know, 6.x from any of those six versions? Um, that should be in the getting started guide. And okay. uh, usually in the help here, um, well, I have to check. This is a pre-release version I'm actually running right here. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, my, my documentation isn't in here, but there is a kind of upgrade path right there. Uh, under uh, help and information 
in the electronic books. Um, if not, you can reach out to us and uh, our support will get you uh, the procedure to do so. You know, generally speaking, if you have a pretty new release, like I got a 6.5 system, I, I do an install over top and it works fine. Um, a lot of times, frankly, customers are switching operating systems, right? They got a Windows 7 box out there, a Windows XP box, and they want to move that into a, a server 19 environment. Uh, my recommendation there is to pick the files that you need. There's a handful of file types you need, pictures, database, driver configuration, um, not too many. And just manually move those into the new folder structure of iFix 2022 and you're pretty good to go. The database is gonna upgrade 100%, the graphics will update 100%, the uh, driver configuration will move over. So, um, um, you know, it, it, should, it should come over, you know, pretty cleanly without a, a ton of work. Great. All right, Greg, well, thank you. Thanks again, and thanks to everybody for the questions today.